Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, let's get started over here. So in many ways, today's class is going to have a lot of conceptual issues. So I'm putting it right out there right now. Monday morning is a good time to have this class. You're fresh. There's going to be some concepts that we're going to have to hold together and try to figure out. It's going to be a little bit of a challenge. Um, I know this from experience, from teaching it twice prior to this. So let's, uh, let's try to pay attention for all of the class. It's, uh, it's all going to come together at the end, I hope, for, for most of you. And if not, we can pick it up in the next class as well. But it is going to be a bit of a challenge because we're going to bring together a lot of the concepts we've taught so far. And unfortunately, this class today also relies on understanding a little bit about a business background, which I will explain to you. Okay? So maybe one way that you can start to see all these examples coming together is to actually see yourself using it. Many of the courses you get taught here are fairly abstract. You don't see yourself applying it right away. But here's one way that you can apply it. And maybe use this as an example in your mind. In a few years from now, you may realize that chemical engineering isn't for you, or you may know that now already. Um, or it might be that your goal when you're 55 is to retire and start your own business based on your hobby or something like that. Either way, these tools can be used to judge that. <coughs> So maybe let me put this idea in your mind. Let's say you want to start a restaurant. And a restaurant's a good example to think about because many of you have been a server in your, in your, um, in your youth. And so you can, you, uh, you can appreciate and you know what goes on behind a restaurant. The business model of a restaurant is also fairly easy to understand. You make food, you sell it at a higher price. Okay? But that doesn't mean that you're going to be a successful restaurant. So when restaurants are considering the purchase of an item, one of the things that might be going through the owner's mind is payback time. You need to purchase a new stove. And the cost of the stove and installation is $91,000. That stove is going to buy you extra capacity in your restaurant so you can create more food and have a larger customer base. And your predictions into the future is that that first year, it's going to cost you quite a bit. That's the negative. $91,000 sunk costs. That's the net costs in the first year. And then after that, you're going to get $20,000 more in sales. The year after that, it's $40,000, then $40,000, $40,000, and then $30,000. And then by that final period, so you've gone six years now. In that six year, you probably consider that stove to be at its end of its life, or whatever that device is. The stove might, uh, might last longer than five, six years. But let's say that in that last year, you consider that to be the total range of the project. That's the finite duration. Okay. Now, we looked at the last class on Friday at payback time. And I, we, the definition is very straightforward. Right? A few of us had a bit of trouble figuring out that it was 2.7 years, but that was just more because of the, our convention of starting the periods at zero. But once you've got your head wrapped around that 2.7 from last class, which you should have by now, you can see then that over the life of this project, you've made $78,000. So you've dropped in $91,000 at the beginning, you get income of 20, 40, 40, 40, 30, and you can say by the end you've made a profit of $78,000. Does everyone see that as a profit number? It's a profit number because we've considered expenses as negatives and incomes as positives. So income minus expenses, we're comfortable with that definition as being profit. So income is positive minus expenses, which are negatives here. If you simply sum up this and calculate the cumulative sum as shown here, you've made a $78,000 profit after your final period. Was that a worthwhile investment? Yeah. You've turned $91,000 of costs into $78,000 of profit. That's pretty good investment by anyone's standard. 
Okay, this is profit. This isn't just the 91,000 to pay back your stove. You've already paid back your stove after, remember, we calculated 2.7 years. So you've paid back that 91,000 and you've gone and made more money. How much more money? $78,000 more than you started with. Okay, so pretty good investment. Except one thing. That $40,000 income here in this year isn't really $40,000 in today's money. Remember, last class we said $40,000 in a future period of time isn't quite the same as if you had that money in your hand now. In fact, that $40,000 in the future is worth less in today's terms. So if you were standing here in today, you could accept a lower dollar value and invest it and grow it to $40,000 in the future. Okay? And we, we can apply that rule to every payment. Every cash amount here in this table can be discounted to bring it to today's value. Okay? So that's what we will in fact look at in today's class is that process. So let me maybe write what we've done here in payback terms. Payback simply says, let's call these cash amounts C0. So take the cash amount C0 plus C1 plus C2 plus C3 and so on. So we can call this our cumulative cash. So your cumulative cash is simply to take those individual cash amounts, sum them up, and the payback time Payback time, very clear that it's time, is defined as the time taken so that the cumulative cash flow equals zero. Okay. So we did that visually last class. We plotted those data and there in red is the cumulative cash flow and the point in time where that crosses zero, the distance from the very beginning to that zero crossing point is called the payback time or payback duration. How long is it going to be before that stove pays you back? Why is this important to a restaurant? It's important to a restaurant because they don't have $91,000 just sitting around waiting to go buy that stove. They need to go borrow it from a bank or from friends and family members. So the first thing the bank is going to want to know is when can you pay me that money back? Or your family member is when are you going to pay that money back to me? Well, the earliest time you can possibly pay your family member back $91,000 is 2.7 years from now. Once you've paid that family member back the $91,000, then any extra money you earn is yours to keep. Okay, but it's going to take at least that long to get that money recovered. Okay. This is so, so important. I was speaking to a lady at Supercrawl, one of the food trucks. She was telling me that they decided specifically to go for a smaller food truck so that they could recover their money and then rather buy a bigger truck a year or two later. Rather than sinking all their money into a big food truck and then their business being unsuccessful, which they said happened to two or three of their other friends who lost all of their money and were not able to recover that back. They rather decided to go small, build up some cash, then go to the bank and say, look, we, this is successful, this is working, get some more cash, buy a bigger food truck and build up their business gradually. But you don't want to sink in all your money and then not be able to recover it back later on in the future. Because remember, those $20,000, $40,000 values over here these are predictions of the future. This hasn't happened yet, right? So you're not certain that this money is actually going to come in. What if, back to this restaurant case study, you buy that new stove, you have all this food available for your customers, but you don't have customers that actually come and buy it, right? Then you don't really get that 20,000, 40,000. These are simply projections out into the future. Okay, so this is your projected payback time that you've, that you've got over here. Everyone clear on that one? Okay, let's move to another one that people will use. It's the return of investment. 
And I said last time that you can see return on investment as the average annual profit divided by fixed capital plus working capital. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on ROI. ROI is a bad metric for a variety of reasons, least of which is that anytime someone uses it in an investment report or in a, in online when you're reading it in the newspaper, they very seldom define what, how ROI is calculated. And everyone has a slightly different way of doing it, and sometimes those slight differences add up to a lot of important detail that's missing. Okay? So there's a big risk with using ROI. It's not very well defined in many cases. How people determine, you can see that even right there in the numerator, the average profit. Well, what's that the average over? Is it the average over five years? Is it the average over 10 years? Is it how, when is, do those profit values come in? Do you get all your profit at the end of the project and none of it at the beginning? Right, so it's very, very poorly defined. So I don't want to spend too much time on this definition. But I do want to spend time telling you what working capital is, because this is an important one to know as an engineer. Okay? So at least let's understand some of those terms in the formula. Working capital is defined here on the next slide, and I'm going to show it to you visually. Okay? I'm gonna, you've got the notes in front of you, so I don't need to have it up here on the board too much. But working capital is that money that's spent just when you get your plant started up. Let's take a look at how a chemical plant is, is built over a period of time. So we're sitting over here at time zero, and we've decided to build our plant or add on a new piece of equipment, like a new distillation column or a new reactor to our process. So at time T0, you sit there, you've got the approval to start the project, and what happens is for the next two years, you start spending money, and you're spending, and you're spending, and you're spending. Okay. Maybe I've gone a little bit too far. So let's say you've spent that much money on all the equipment installation. You've got contractors coming and going. There's lots of money being sunk into building and adding to your new process. Okay. We're going to talk about all of that in a week or two from now, how to estimate those costs. But for now, you've, we've spent that money. Now the process is ready, ready to be start putting into production. But you've got this empty distillation column and this empty reactor here. What we need to do is we need to fill it up with our initial material, our initial catalyst. We have to purchase initial raw material to get this process started. And that money over there often gets spent in a very quick period of time. You get all this new equipment, uh, new materials and products delivered to your site. Okay, so that's up there, raw materials on the, on the board, on the projector slide, I should say. Okay, so this spent money here is working capital. And we call it working capital because it works for us. We're going to get to use those raw materials to make money later on. That catalyst is going to be used and making money for us later on. So now we start to make money, and our investment goes up and up over time. So we s okay. But the reason why it's called working capital is because we get to recover that money. Right? Those raw materials get converted into final products, which you sell. And you buy more raw materials, put it into your process. Buy more raw materials, put it into your process. If you take a process, think of any chemical plant, a pharmaceutical factory, a bio, bio system. You take it at a particular point in time and you if, imagine you could visually just freeze it, like stop production. At that moment, in that snapshot in time, there is stuff in the process. There is stuff in your pipes. There is catalyst. There's raw materials. There's things there, right? All of that material that's locked up in the process is inventory. That's working capital. That's money you've spent, but it's working for you. It's going to move through the system and move out, and you're going to put new material in, move it through, and move it out. Okay, so working capital is that initial stuff that you have to purchase, those supplies. And so that's all those things that are listed up here on the slide. Okay, are form, form working capital. 
So in other words, what I'm saying there is your denominator in the ROI formula is not only your capital expenses of your equipment and the installation, but it's also the extra goods that you have to buy to get started. So it's extra costs beyond the fixed costs. Okay. And if you take a look at the ROI formula, it's a ratio in the numerator of average annual profit. So in your numerator, you have units of dollars per year divided by dollars in the denominator. Okay, so you get a percentage per year as ROI. Often people will just simply say ROI is a percentage, but it's percentage per unit time. because you have to consider that numerator, the profit, over some fixed duration. So profit over a month, profit over a year, profit over some fixed duration. Yes, Niall. The working material is uh, <coughs> measured in terms of one year's ROI. Well, this is total cost to get started. So it's not, it's not over a period of time. There's no time in the denominator. Fixed capital is that distillation column, the equipment that you purchase. So it's, it's there for you permanently. So Working capital is the total amount of capital to get your process up and running. Sort of like the startup costs. Including raw materials. Including RMs, yeah. Raw materials. Okay. It's just an important definition to know working capital is, is, is a term you're going to hear in your career. So let's understand what that is. Okay, so ROI can be calculated as a percentage, and I'm going to pretty much leave it at that definition. It's clear that higher ROIs are better than low, lower ROIs. Larger return on investments are better than lower return on investments. Okay, now let's come to the next one. This is, yes, Mark. Yes, so if the banks was paying interest at 5% on an investment and you could get a return on investment in your process of 15% or 20%, you'd certainly invest in your process rather than the bank. Okay, so I'm going, to cut, I'm going to come to that topic in a minute. Okay, let's talk about the next one, net present value. Now, take a look at this formula. If you want to look at this purely from an algebraic point of view, NPV simply says take your cash amounts, so C's are your cash amounts, and then multiply it by this bracket, which is got that minus N there. You can see it as division. Let me maybe write that formula out for you a different way. So if we look at NPV, it says NPV is a sequence of cash amounts. So C1, C2, C3, those are those regular cash flows we had earlier. And the first one we divide through by 1 plus i to the 0, which is essentially just saying divide through by 1. The second cash flow, C1, gets divided through by 1 plus i to the 1. If we look back at that formula that's on, your, on the slides, it's a little bit cut off here. Fortunately, this class, you're going to have to get used to me putting the board up and down. I've requested a separate blackboard, but they can't provide one for me. So we'll have to just deal with this. So C1 divided by 1 plus i to the power 1. C2 is the next cash flow divided by 1 plus i to the power 2. So it's getting divided through by a larger denominator. That term in the denominator is larger than the term in the denominator prior. C3, 1 plus i to the 3, and so forth. Okay, so that's all that that summation <coughs> tells us, is take your cash flows and divide it through by this changing denominator. And NPV is simply defined as the sum of all of those, the sum up of these present values. So let's put it this way, that first term, over here is 
in today's money. So that cash flow here gets no discounting because we're dividing through by one. This term over here is the present value of cash flow one. Okay, so it's as if we got cash flow one, which is going to be a year from now, expressed in today's terms. So what is the present value, the value in the present time, of cash flow one? Cash flow two, in the same way, C3 then, is the present value of the cash flow in that period. So we're simply taking the present values of successive cash flows, summing them up. And another word for sum is net. You take the net of them or the sum of them. And so we call that the net present value, the sum of the present values or NPV. So when people talk about NPVs, they're just simply taking these cash flows, accounting for time value of money, and then summing them up. Okay. Everyone clear on that? Okay, let's go give that a try. Calculate the NPV for those sequence of cash flows up there on the board. It should take about a minute or so on your calculator if you're quick. But write down each of the six individual NPV values. Okay, so present value of the first cash flow, minus 91,000. The same value, minus 91,093. The present value of the second cash flow. Sorry, Helen. 17,391. Okay, we're at 15%, 15% interest rates or 15% time value of money. So I'm going to start using that more instead of interest rates or deflation. I'm going to just call it time value of money, that interest rate I. So 17,391, the next payment, the next cash flow, 40,000. I think with rounding. And then the next one, 40,000 is, sorry? 26,301. 26,301. Okay. You can keep going in that way. So notice these two payments, are, are these two cash flows are 40,000 and 40,000, but in the, in, the, in the subsequent year, it's worth less money. Okay. And then the final column, you can calculate what's called the cumulative value of the present values. And so that's minus 91,093. And then it's minus 73,702. And then minus 43,456. And you can keep going in that way. Okay, and in fact, the answers are in the next slide for you over there. So let's, uh, 
Let's take a look at that slide. There's no need to copy this down. The spreadsheet is on the, in, the, in your notes as well as on the website. So on the website, you can actually go see the formulas that are underneath that cell and click on them and see the calculations. But essentially, we've got that cumul this running cumulation, not minus 91, minus 73, minus 43,000, minus 17,000. Then we become positive at 5,000. And then in our final year that we own that stove in our restaurant, we've got an NPV of 20,600. Now, I've contrasted that, and this is, comes back with why I said in today's class, I'm going to ask you to have multiple things in your head at one go. Remember, at the start of the class, we simply calculated the cumulative cash flow. We didn't account for the deflating value of money. We simply calculated the cumulative sum, and we got $78,000. Okay? And we said that that $78,000 was $78,000 on profit. Here with NPV, we've done a similar calculation. The only difference in the NPV calculation is we've got this discounted denominators. It's the only difference. And now that number, that cumulative sum is 20,600. So anyone want to interpret what I should take away from that $20,000 value? How should I interpret that? Okay, so that's a, yeah, it's a bending way of seeing it, but yeah. So if you got that $20,000 today, it would be the equivalent as if you got all these cash flows in the future, is how I would say it, rather, rather than the $78,000. Okay. One way to see that is if you calculated the profitability of this device that you bought, it's worth $20,600 in today's terms. It is our profit made on this device in today's money. Recognizing that future cash flows, these $40,000 that you're going to get in future years, are not quite worth $40,000 in those future years. In today's terms, those $40,000 cash flows are worth $30,000, $26,000, $22,000. Okay? And if we sum them up, we get a profit of $20,600. So here's the interpretation of that value. It is the profit we would have made over the six years with that device in today's money. Profit made in today's terms. That's all it is, NPV. Okay. You have to be able to know that. I've been asked several times when I've done uh, financial justification in my previous job. <laughs> I worked for a boss who's like, can you explain to me what NPV is? <laughs> like he'd forgotten, right? Or it's unclear. Not everyone kind of gets it explained or understands it really well. NPV is simply profit in today's terms. In today's money, in today's money. Okay, everyone got that concept written down and, and understood. Okay, now let me take, ask you, was there a question? No? Let me ask you to take it a step further now and think about it. What if that value was minus 10,000? Okay, explain it to each other. What does minus 10,000 mean as an NPV? Okay, so everyone's got an understanding of what negative 10,000 is. Either the person next to you or yourself knows what negative 10,000 NPV means. As Mark said, it's not good. Okay, anyone else want to give a, a definition that expands a little bit on that? Niall? It means that in today's terms you would be at a $10,000 loss. 
in today's terms, you would be at a $10,000 loss. Okay. No payback on that. What if NP, yes, sorry. It's not justified at that interest rate. Okay, you would have made a loss at 15% interest rates. Okay, let's hold that important thought in your head. It's a, at 15% interest rates, you would have made a loss. What if NPV was exactly zero? Okay, Huma says you'd be indifferent about it. What's another way to, to say that? You broke even, okay. Any other interpretation that you want to make from that? That's correct. You would have broken even. You're indifferent about it. Kalia, three in a row over there. You got exactly 15% back on, on your investment, provided you actually got those incomes later on in the future, okay. Another way to say it is that Deciding to choose to spend that $91,000 back, back then at now in today's terms, you could have either chosen to not spend it or you could have invested it elsewhere at 15% and made the same amount of money. That's the indifferent aspect that Ahima is referring to. Okay. So you, you, made, you made nothing on it, but you didn't lose anything on it okay. at 15% interest. Now let me ask you the next question. Let's say NPV is zero dollars. Okay. What happens if the interest rate goes up? So you, your NPV is currently zero dollars. Take a look at the formula. Currently you're at zero. So this NPV is zero. This sum of terms is zero. Now I go and I tweak this I value. And instead of 15%, I go make it 20%. What's going to happen to NPV? Think about it for a second. Discuss it maybe with someone. NPV going to go up or NPV going to go down? It's going to go down. So at higher deflation of money, higher time value of money, that investment's going to be even less profitable. Currently, you're just breaking even. If interest rates had to go up, your NPV would be negative. That's where the biggest problem is with the next section I'm going to introduce. So make sure you understand that concept. Let's, let's do it again. NPV is currently zero. What happens if interest rates go down? I goes from 15% to 10%. NPV becomes positive. Okay, does everyone see that? At least if you don't get it intuitively or from a business perspective, at least see it mathematically. If I make I go from 0.15 to 0.1 in this denominator, I'm dividing by smaller numbers. So if currently my sum is at zero, and now I'm dividing through by smaller numbers, I'm deflating by a smaller value, I'm adding those numbers up and I'm going to get something that's positive. Let me ask you this now. What happens if I, the interest rate, is zero? What, ha what do you get? If I is zero, all you've done then is get back to this column, the cumulative cash flow, as if you took no time value of money into account. And that's exactly what I said back there earlier. When you calculate payback time, it doesn't take time value of money into account. You simply take those cash flows and you add them up. So essentially, all these denominators become ones. Okay? Yes, Mark. No, yeah, no, I don't want you to see it like that. <laughs> there's, there's a confusing reason for that. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about it later. Yeah. Uh, quick question. Um, if you're at zero right now and you're yeah. your interest, or the interest rate or the inflation rate to a very large number, how do you end up with a negative? So why would you just end up with the same number overall? Because your eye is 
Okay, so if I increase I, let's say we're currently at 15% and I go to 20%. You're just adding very, very small numbers to zero. That's like something I. But you're not. You're dividing through by a denominator that's 1.2. 1, and then this is 1.2 squared, 1.2 cubed. Right? So you're dividing through by a larger number, which means that these sum, these terms in the sum are smaller and smaller. No, you're at zero because you've got some negatives and some positives. Yeah. Yeah. And so now those positive cash flows are worth less and less in the future. Let's do this in a spreadsheet. This is a good time to, to see this. Now, unfortunately, um, let's see if I can make this a little bigger. How's that for visibility? Okay, so what I want you to take a look at is here, we're currently at 15%, 0.15, and there's my cash flow of 20,000. So let's just go to a larger view here. Okay, so now you can see the plot. And what's going to happen here is we're going to adjust that interest rate I. Ah, this is so frustrating. Okay, there we go. Okay, so currently we're at 15% interest rate. We're making a cumulative cash flow of 20,000. If I change that interest rate up, as you all correctly predicted, to 20%, we're now making a cumulative cash flow of 7,000. If I change that interest rate to 0.25, I've now made negative 2,799. So if time value of money was at 25%, I'm deflating money faster and faster, those future cash flows of 40,000 are now worth less and less and less. And if you keep going to higher and higher time values of money, that number becomes more and more negative. So at 30% time value of money, that number is now minus 11,000. Exactly. So if time value of money is zero, that blue line matches exactly with the red. Okay. Now let me come to the next important point I want you to think of. I gave you that example of the restaurant and you want to go buy that new stove, you need 91,000 as a restaurant owner you're just making ends meet. You're pay getting your money coming in, you're paying your staff, you're paying for food, raw materials. You don't have $91,000 spare. Companies are exactly in the same position. Companies do not sit on piles and piles of money and cash. Most of the income coming in goes to salaries, goes to raw materials, goes to taxes, insurance, and other expenses. Okay, so companies are in the same position where does a company go to get money? They don't have friends and family. Where do companies get their money? The government? Bank? Investors. Those are the two sources. Investors and banks in general. Uh, sorry, investors and banks. And where, where else? There's one other one, actually. Let's, I'm going to call banks and investors the same thing. The owner, customers, stocks. Okay, so the two general sources of income are banks, and you can call banks investors as well. Just the when we're talking about investing into into a company, these are people with large amounts of money. So they're generally banks or big investors. The other source of in, of money is stocks. Okay. And people in the finance area, you call these things different names. You call stocks equity. Okay. And you call banks debt. Okay. So companies have two sources of income, debt and equity. Those are the two technical terms that the management students are comfortable with. The rest of you can simply see them as either you're going to the bank to get your money or you're going to the stock market to get your money. Those are usually your two options. Okay. 
Now, you don't get all your money from one source. You get some of it from the bank, some of it from the stock market. And each company has a slightly different ratio of it. Now, when you go to the bank to get your money, what's one thing the bank wants to know? Your credit history. And they want to know if you can pay it back. Okay, and they're going to charge you an interest rate on that. The banks always get their money back. Or most, most often, they get their money back. If you get your money from the stock market, you're going to the general public to get your money. Okay? And are you promising the, comp the, the public anything back? There's no express requirement other than you hope your stock price goes up so that you get more people giving you money in the future. If your stock price goes down, well, people are going to like, see up, no more money. Okay, so you don't want to generally piss off the people giving you money through stocks. But there's no guarantee either that you're going to get your money back. Okay, so debt is less risky than equity. Equity is more risky. And when risk is high, people want higher returns. Banks are not going to ask for high, high percentage rates. They're going to ask for moderate returns. But on your stock market, you're going to want to give your investors higher returns to justify the risk that they're taking on. So what companies do is, because they get a mix of their money from debt and a mix of their money from equity at different rates, companies sit back and they calculate a blended number from that. They calculate a blended number from those two. And that number tells them how much return they need to make on their money in order to keep paying back the banks and to keep paying back their investors. Okay? And they call it a minimal acceptable rate of return. M-A-R-R. -R, minimal acceptable rate of return. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to jump forward a few slides over to slide 60 some and talk a little bit about minimal acceptable rate of return. There's another term for minimal acceptable rate of return, weighted average cost of capital. And that weighted average exactly refers to this. How much weight do you give to each cost of capital? Capital is money that the company gets. So what is this capital costing them, right? Companies don't get their money for free from the banks and for free from the stock market. There's a cost associated with that. There's interest payments. There's shareholder payments that you have to make back to your shareholders as dividends or by, by uh, stock buyouts. But either way, you've got to pay for that money. Companies don't get money for free at all. So that's the weighted average cost of capital. And there's different sources of capital, as I said. So a bank interest and bank loans, these are fairly low. And as you go higher, so you go to venture capital markets and high risk investments, those returns are higher. The cost of that money is higher. So you've got this great startup idea and you go to a venture capital investor, they're not going to want 5%, 10% returns. They're going to want double digit returns. The cost of getting money from venture capitalists is much, much greater than getting that money from the bank. Okay? The bank is not likely to give you the money because you're new, you've got no track record. So you're likely to get that money from a venture capitalist, but it's going to cost you more to get it from that person. Everyone clear on that? We have, this is where it's confusing because we have to understand where this money comes from and why there's costs associated excuse me, associated with it to understand the next concept. Okay? So the key thing is money that you get doesn't come for free if you're working in a company. So let's, let's maybe take a look at this. If you're in a company and you're working in an area that's fairly low risk, those MARRs are low values. Okay? What type of company is in the second category? Think of a company that's, that's over there. Any suggestions for the type of company or the name of a company that you know, a Canadian company that 
falls in that second category. Maybe discuss, discuss it with someone around you and maybe look at the third and the fourth category as well. Quickly talk about what type of company or the name of a company falls into category two, three, and four. Okay, any suggestions? A company where the risk is low, new production capacity in an established market. What, are we, what type of things are we talking about? ExxonMobil, SO. So they've got an existing plant, they've got an existing market, they're adding to it by building a new plant. Okay. Category three, a new product or technology in an established market position. Any examples of that? Yeah, show us. Apple, with respect to what type of product? Apple is a diverse company, so. Okay, so their new watch is their new product in an established market position. Is yeah. New product or technology in an established market position. Apple is, is probably between here, new product in a new market. Their watch is a new product in a new market. Apple is new to that game. Okay, their, I, their new iPhone update would be a new product in an established market. But a totally new device, uh, like so the iPad three, four years ago would have been over there. Now the iPad is considered established. So the tablet market is an established market. Okay, the risks are higher when you go to that. Google Glass would be another example. Um, oil sands production. Investments in the oil sand is you're, you're bringing in a new technology in an established market. So you're still in oil and gas, but bringing in a new technology. So what I want you to get from this table is the key idea that a company can have multiple minimal acceptable rates of return. Okay, so depending on where that company is operating, a diverse company may have multiple MARRs. If they're simply expanding an existing line, lower risks and lower returns are expected. If they're going into a new technology, if they're going into a new country that they've never operated in before, the risks are greater, so they're going to expect greater returns from that money. What I want you to get from this is we're going to see ourselves as the CEO of the company. In next class, see yourself as the CEO of the company. You've got a limited amount of money to give to projects. Which projects do you pick and how are you going to pick them? Okay, and this table is going to help guide that decision.